Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's going to be having kind of a loud video today. You see, it's Thanksgiving in America. Happy Thanksgiving to those of you who celebrate. And my wife is currently cooking some duck, some biscuits, some sweet potatoes, some cranberry sauce. Anything else? And Brussels sprouts. So she's gonna be over there doing that. Toby's on the couch, he's about to bark. My daughter's on the couch as well. But it's gonna be kind of a fun Thanksgiving episode. And in honor of Thanksgiving, I'm not gonna be talking about an American group. Because you know, American groups should be taking a break. So instead of my traditional Thunderground Thursday, I'm gonna be doing an international album. The album Civilisation, Civilization, by French rap artist Orelsan, O-R-E-L-S-A-N. I'm very excited to talk about this album. This is an artist that my family likes and that I like quite a bit. And what's interesting is the last video I did was on Aesop Rock. And I talked about the difficulties I have with white rappers. And I tried to, not with white sweaters. I have no problem with white sweaters. Look at this thing, it's gorgeous. A Christmas gift last year from the Dr. and Mrs. I, my problem with white rappers isn't that they're white. It's that the reason that I love hip hop as a global phenomenon, not just as an American phenomenon, is that it is the voice of the voiceless, right? So everywhere across the world, wherever there's a civilization, wherever there's people who need representation in popular culture, who need to have their voice, have their concerns heard, that is what hip hop is for. And that way it transcends race. But that said, Oralson, as one of the rare white rappers in France, doesn't really represent the voice of the voiceless. He's a handsome, charismatic white guy, exactly the kind of musician and pop star that has always gotten the most attention in France. I suppose you could say that he's a little bit marginalized by his geographical identity as a Norman, as in from Normandy, the town of Caen, but not really. That said, as always, what we have to think about when we're thinking about these rappers who don't represent the voice of the voiceless is what do they add and what do they bring? As I said in my video about Aesop Rock, it is too narrow to just simply say hip hop is this and it has to do that and it can't do other things. The other beauty about hip hop is what an amazingly amorphous art form it is, how many things it can integrate. And what I find interesting is over the history, the relationship between French hip hop and what is known as variété française, French variety music. French variety music is a sort of catch-all term for basically any music. And up until recently, that was any music that was French that was not hip-hop. At its worst, French variety music is regressive, is cheesy, is tied to a certain white, Catholic, heterosexual view of France. Think of it as sort of like adult contemporary music. I remember going into the FNAC in 2000, that's like a, a CD store in France, and always being happy that when I wanted to look for French music, I could go straight to le rap français and I could bypass le variété française. I could skip le variété française. So why am I bringing this up? Well, I think the worst of Oralson is a sort of French variety hip hop, moving a little bit more towards that end of hip hop, as opposed to something that stands at odds with traditional French culture, with traditional French values, it is perhaps more in line with French variety music. But hidden in all of the junk that's in French variety music is also much of the best music of France. That's why you'll find singers like Barbara, Léo Ferré, artists who belong to what is called the chanson tradition, now, chanson, that's our new oven, it's making beeps. The chanson tradition is a, it just means song, and it pertains to singers who sing often in the third person. And it'll be about society, about civilization, and it's very tied to a poetic tradition. In France, they often talk about how we can start at I don't know, Dubélé and pass through Baudelaire and Rimbaud and then we arrive at the great chanson singers and their great poetry. But what interests me more when thinking about Oralson as potentially being a bridge or perhaps somebody who straddles both the worlds of chanson française uh, and rap français is the chanson tradition in relationship to les moralistes. 
Lots of terms right now. Sorry for that that sound in the background. That's what you cooking over? What you chopping? Well, I'm just mixing the stuffing. So dressing. Ah. Stuffing? This yeah, I think in, in England it's called dressing. Well, it's whether you put it inside a turkey or bake it separately. Okay. And we and we don't do turkey in this house. Turkey is an inferior meat. For those of you who like turkey, I would like to inform you that there exists something called chicken. It's true, and it tastes good. There also exists duck. So let's talk about the moraliste, okay? Let's think about chanson in this tradition of what I will call for the rest of this video, for you American and Ang Anglophone viewers, the moralists. Now before you start thinking, oh, moralists, morality, no. There's no correlation between morality and moralist. When I'm talking about a moralist, I'm talking about somebody who is concerned with societal mores. M-O-R-E-S, not the eel, the habits of society. Somebody who studies society and observes why people do what they do. Observes and reports on the human condition with a sort of haughty, uh, distanced precision, clarity, Perhaps the trait that is best seen in the moralists is that of lucidity. It's that lucidity that comes through in Oralson's album, Civilization. But before I even get to it, let's try to, let's, let's just go with this idea. That what Oralson is bringing to hip hop, what justifies his presence and his existence, because he's a huge rapper. This album is selling tons of, of records and, and it made me a little bit uncomfortable because, you know, I don't want just just some random white rapper to be the biggest rapper in France, which he's not, but he's one of the biggest. So what does he actually bring to French hip hop? I think he's a moraliste, a little bit in the tradition of Pascal, who has kind of a severe Christian perspective, but is also a great relativist, a great analyst of self-love, like what motivates people, how our love of ourself changes the relationship between how we are and how we want to appear. But I talk often about my, my dissertation, my, my specialty. It's actually in 17th century French literature. I just don't get a chance to talk about it much. So whenever I can, I will shoehorn it into my videos. But less so Pascal, I see him a little bit more like La Bruyère and his uh, work Les Caractères, in which he does character sketches. And in these character sketches, He's able to unveil deeper truths about his time and about people in general. That's the thing about the Moralistes, which is so interesting, is they were talking about France in the 1600s, but what they were talking about is applicable to everything. As an example, he, uh, La Bruyère has an entire sketch all about, uh, an entire character sketch, all about somebody who is a collector. And as he collects, he starts to resemble the thing that he collects. It's a very funny and interesting idea that is paired with this understanding that people who collect don't really love what they collect, they just love what's new and what is rare. But really, the person who I think we could best compare Horasson to is La Rochefoucauld. I don't have a book, they're at my office. You never know what books I have here, what books I have in my office. La Rochefoucauld is interesting because he just gives little quips, little maxims that are cute and devastating. If I could say one thing about Horasson is that his lyrics are cute and devastating. Let me give you some examples from the Rochefoucauld. In jealousy, there is more self-love than love. One often goes from love to ambition, but one rarely comes back from ambition to love. One is neither as happy nor as sad as they think they are. We promise according to our hopes and perform according to our fears. Come on. Ah. Self-love is more capable than the most capable man. I'm gonna stop now before I turn into Jack Palance in contempt. But what we see in all of these quotes are these piercing, pithy, interesting, funny comments about society and the way that we are. Like the way that we do. What are the real motivations? There's another one. It's uh, the refusal of a compliment is the desire to be complimented twice. 
you know? Like these kinds of observations, like about false humility, about false piety, all these contradictions that we see in La Rochefoucauld, we are also going to see in Civilisation by Oralson, who is taking a scalpel and dividing up modern civilization throughout the world, French civilization, and finding all these hypocrisies on the left, on the right, and proposing a somewhat hopeful, somewhat bleak vision of civilization itself. All the way throughout, it's mostly produced by his longtime collaborator, Scred, S-K-R-E-A-D, which I think is like a French slang for like discreet, kind of interesting name. But let me give you an example, okay? Let's jump into it. We're 10 minutes in, my hair's falling down, my Chris Evans sweater is a little bit too hot. It's okay, I'll get through it here. Let's talk about this first single off the album, The Smell of Gas, L'Odeur de l'Essence. I'll include a link to it up there, to the video. This video is absolutely astounding, totally moving. It's Oralson in front of this gigantic screen while everything that's happening. It's got a very cool beat with an interesting kind of thumpy rhythm. This voice choir in the back, which sometimes will be used during the verse and like turned into glissando, and it creates a lot of tension. At the beginning of most lines, you will hear him say with a double, tripled voice, oh God, which means look. He's kind of setting up each line. Each line in the song is kind of like a maxim from La Rochefoucauld. All the way throughout the song it creates tension and interest. And then it cuts out in the chorus with just these siren sounds. Just saying the simple things over and over again. The smell of gas, the smell of gas. Meaning that the world is on fire and what we smell now is the smell of gas. The lyrics are good enough that I gave to my son the assignment of translating the first verse, which he did not do. This morning, my daughter was sitting around, didn't know what to do, doesn't have school. So I gave her the sheet and she did it. This right here is what a proud poppy looks like. Look at this work right there. Look at that. Look, look at all that translation. Now, she's a little bit embarrassed because, well, she doesn't understand how direct objects, indirect objects work. So a lot of this is very confusing. Sometimes her translations were a little bit literal, but still she got the essence of what is being said. So I'm going to let you know some of the words that are said throughout this song, which is basically one-liner after one-liner about the state of humanity. It opens up with, Nostalgia makes them dream of a France that they had only fantasized about. Later, fear persuades them that foreigners will replace them in their living rooms. Paranoia makes them think it's difficult to go outside. Hatred plunges them to extremes, lights the fire, and sets everything ablaze. Lines like that for like 10, 12 straight lines, and then it just cuts out the smell of gas, the smell of gas. And then it starts up again with this in the background. Right. Can you... Can, uh, goat, can we get the shao 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 shao? She's upstairs. Oh, I thought she was on the couch. That's good. H how about you? Can I get some shao 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 shao? No, I forget it. And then the next verse comes back in with more of these questions. What governs us? Fear and anxiety. Okay, so talking about government, a lot of this album is about how we are governed and how we ask ourselves to be governed. History belongs to those who write it. Nobody listens, everybody talks, no one changes their opinion, only sterile debates. Everyone is excited uh, because everyone uh, is uh, pushed to hatred, the tyranny of numbers, intelligence sells less than polemics, no solution, only critics, Everyone is so sensitive, everyone is so sensitive, everyone is so sensitive, keeps repeating, repeating, repeating. And, and the whole time, like you're just feeling like just the screws are being tightened on you while you listen to this song. You get super, super, super excited and angry and it paints this very clear picture in a way like a, like a good comedian would or any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, cultural examiner who studies the way in which media and social media divides us and puts us against each other in a way. I think this might be the French Bo Burnham. <laughs> uh, it's not as funny, but I think in a similar way, it speaks to the alienation and the anger and the stupidity of our divisions and the way that that stupidity is monetized and sold back to us. Also, a fair amount of comments on kids drinking and how evil 
uh, evil comes from alcohol. That's one of the themes of this album. It's about the evils of alcohol. You're either for or against. It's binary. The buzz scrapers flirt with the extremes. I think it goes on and on with this metaphors about Mongolia and about how we are turning into Mongols and then how eventually our society will disappear like the Mongolian society, like Egypt, like Greece. Generation Z, because it's the last, goes on to discuss how the grandmother will vote for the fascists, for Marine Le Pen, the FN, because she only has three years to live. This great divide between who votes and who doesn't and who has to live with the concept, with the meaning of that vote. And then it ends with a verse that focuses, it gets much more global. So on one hand, this, is, this song is very preachy. It's a very preachy album, definitely very preachy. But I like how it gets a little bit more global and talks about like, the lack of empathy. You know, So after this beautiful part where he talks about how everyone is nostalgic for a time when people were already nostalgic for a time when people were already nostalgic, right? I just saw that Garbage Fire uh, Ghostbusters movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and that's very much a movie that makes people nostalgic for the 80s, which was a time when people were already nostalgic, which was a time in the 50s where people were already nostalgic for time in the 30s, like always going back and going back and going back. So he has this kind of clever, very of the moment thinking. Right? But then it enlarges to a question of a lack of empathy and that that's really what we're lacking in all of this. We sp the final lines of the song are, we spit on each other and don't know how to live together. We fight to be at the front of a plane that is heading for a crash. That's the last words of the song. Crash, all of a sudden, the smell of gas is perhaps the smell of gas that remains after a plane crash. I don't know, but it's a very unpleasant, very intense, very moving, disturbing, and accurate song. <clears throat> Whew. That, that's, that's the stamp. That's the example. The rest of the album is not always that good. The opening song, Shonen, isn't really a song. It's like a mournful piano with some very standard drum beats here. Uh, kind of talking about, like, I make errors and I'll make them again. I do like how he refers to himself as being uh, the son of a pagan. Uh, that is the truth. Most French people are descendants from people that Romans called pagans. Uh, they lived in the countryside. A pagan really just meant that you were, like, not close to Rome. You didn't know about Jesus. You were a pagan. And that refers to the countryside. And the word in French for that is païen. And my last name is Payne. So I, my, I am actually the son of a pagan. That is literally what my last name means. So that's kind of nice. But it's kind of an unremarkable song that leads into a song called La Quête. Now, this means the quest, and this is by far the most variety song on the entire album. This is like, I could just imagine, you know, being somebody who would vote for the FN, listening to this song and being like, oh, what a nice fun song. Now it is a little bit deeper than that. He's recounting his childhood kind of year by year, kind of a Melanie Martinez childish style beat. It's about like the his growth and how each year he's growing up, but now he just wants time to stop. I do like how it goes through the stages of disillusionment in childhood, but it concludes with this sort of like the universe isn't so bad. It's not the destination that counts. It's the journey. You know, it's a little live, laugh, love. <clears throat> This is by far his worst instincts, and this is where I think, even though I like the song, he's just a part of French variety music with a song like this. This doesn't have any of that strength. The next song, Du Propre, basically impossible to, to, uh, to translate. Sort of means like clean, like clean ones. And this is, I like this, because it's kind of a club banger. Now this is the thing, I don't think that like a simple song without a message forcibly means that it belongs in this sort of variety category. This song is just a fairly straightforward song about his skill and about his power and about his, 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 his mutable morality. But it's got this great kind of instrumental beat that then goes into an, uh, like a kind of like a club, like instrumental at the very end. You know, you follow fashion, we make it. You know, it's just a very simple, straightforward hip hop song about how awesome he is. Even though this doesn't have the, the strength or the weight of a song like The Smell of Gas, I think it's actually just a perfectly fine French rap song about being awesome. 
Bebe Bois is the next song, which he produced himself. A very cool kind of simple beat with these like synthesizers that kind of stab, that go and then get cut off. A little funk groove with some vocoders and some chopped up whistling. This may be the best beat on the album, even though he produced it himself. And this is a song about alcoholism, about his, his, his girlfriend being an alcoholic. And it's an interesting, like, I don't know, I haven't really thought about the effects of drinking on a relationship as put into a rap song. So in that way, it's an interesting sort of entry into life as described by music. Rêve mieux is the next song, which means dream better. Cool kind of vocoder, maybe auto-tuning singing here. Very spacey, downbeat. Like, the vocalization is very important here because there's just a lot of space. A lot of bass and a lot of space. And at the chorus, there's barely even more, just a little bit of synthesizers. This is really a place to have him rap. And here he's rapping about the need to dream better. I love this song. Starts off, you have no taste and it's not COVID. F your mom, your luxury and your product placement. You don't have a style. You are just an algorithm sucker. <laughs> you Basically, you blow the algorithm. That's what he's really saying. So he just starts right off talking about the, the difference between money and taste and about how we're all basically being programmed and formatted to want the same things, to dream after the same things. All, the, all that the rich want is that which they cannot have. Before getting rich, you wouldn't believe. I know a lot of stars, they're all ish. If you ran across them, your dreams would be broken. So this anti-capitalist, uh, anti-wealth, anti-fame song has this beautiful chorus, dream better. Better than money, better than power, better than both, dream to be happy. A charming, interesting, well put, well enunciated uh, verse. Uh, the second verse, unfortunately, is sort of about cancel culture, which uh, maybe it's not as big of a dog whistle in France for sort of uh, regressive politics. Um, it is interesting that what he's really talking about here, and this is where we're, we're maybe getting back to the Mohadist, is he isn't saying that people shouldn't be canceled. He's talking about the desire to appear woke or the desire to appear to be a correct thinker bien penseur, and that that's actually what's at the root of it. And it's not actually a desire for justice or honesty, but it's a desire to be seen that way. And in that way, he is, he could not be more of a moraliste. The next song, Seul avec du monde autour, means alone with a bunch of people around you. And this song is just a banger. You have to listen to this song. It's got like this child piano, late 90s rap drum beat. It's just... Oh, I, just, I keep playing. I keep getting in the car. I keep meaning to play some other song. I keep playing that. Not just because I'm trying to teach my kids the awesome French that's in there, but it's a song about sort of modern alienation. I think we can compare this pretty well with the British uh, rapper Dave and his album, We Are All Alone in This Together. A very similar theme about isolation uh, while also being surrounded by other people. He talks about, you know, goodbye Twitter, goodbye Instagram, goodbye Snap. But then he talks about how he's just working all the time. Just working, working, working. Like working on his beats, working on his look, working on his videos, working on all this stuff. But then he says, it's a vacation in my head. I also happen to like that he talks about he lives in a very, uh, a very crappy city with the Eiffel Tower in it. Just that's a, a funny way to describe Paris. Uh, he even refers to himself as not being a real rapper because he wakes up too early. I don't know. And then I really enjoy the last verse because he talks about what his life is really like and about how basically he's just playing too many video games. He's playing as the team from his hometown, Caen, um, in FIFA in the video game, kind of showing maybe a real side of, of what his life is actually like. Good gravy. This album is so dense. I hope you're having a, a good Thanksgiving. It smells so good in here. What's that smell? That's the stuffing. Interestingly, we, we were in a rush and my wife bought sourdough bread for the stuffing. A little known fact about uh, Professor Sky, I hate sourdough bread. I once asked my wife, why do they take perfectly good bread and just put sour in it? Yeah, but hopefully the rest of the stuffing will make up for it. That's a little intro, a little interlude, a little anti-commercial uh, leading up to the song Man Manifest. 
Now this is an absolutely masterful story about a protest. Musically, it gets increasingly maximal, lots of interesting sounds in the background of the protests as they're happening. The, ten, like the drums are used and the keyboards are used to just turn the screws on you and to get you as the, as the protest devolves, the music increases, and it's all about a protest. This is where I'm really confident that he's in the tradition of La Bruyere because he's telling this story about these characters and these characters each represent a different perspective, a different place, different flaws, and those flaws are being explained through the stories. And it's Orelson as the moraliste who's observing these people and outlining their stories and allowing us as the viewer, without, without having to have the moral of the story is, you're able to figure out what the moral is just by the story. So it's, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna outline it for you because you have to listen to it, like you do. See, I get it, you don't speak French. I don't speak French, Sky, am I supposed to? I'm telling you how to understand it. So it opens up with him and his friend Mickey inviting him to hang out in Paris. Now, it's possible to read Mickey as a, you know, like Mickey Mouse and Disney in America. I'm not convinced that's what this is about, okay? And unknowingly, he's invited to a protest and he's mad about this. Now this is part of a long tradition of, of French literature and philosophy about unknowingly being in a parade or a protest. Céline has a, a story about how he ended up in the First World War because he just jumped into a parade that was walking by and ended up with him enlisting in the army by mistake. But more importantly, he says, I don't care about society, I'm an effing artist. And in this way, he's a part of La Varieté Française very much in the tradition of Georges Brassens, who has a song about dying for ideas. So in 1968, there were a lot of protests in France, the entire country shut down. And a lot of artists, you know, like Renaud and, and other sort of revolutionary artists were there and they were taking part of the revolution. Well, there was a whole bunch of other artists being like, I guess Brassens had a pipe. I, I'm not so sure. Brassens has this beautiful song, Dying for Ideas is a Wonderful Idea. They almost killed me for not having one. <laughs> he goes on and on to explain that our only luxury is life. So it's not worth it to die for ideas. This kind of weird distance from a protest, which of course, fundamentally comes from a place of privilege. Another interesting thing, I talk, teach about this in one of my classes, the great rock and roller, uh, Johnny Halliday, not great, but the most famous French rock and roller, Johnny Halliday, was quoted in an interview saying like, he, was, he had a cigarette. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't concern me. I, I didn't take part in that. It wasn't about me. I wasn't interested in it. He like repeats himself like three or four times because he's so nervous. Even though he got famous for incarnating this revolutionary music, he didn't want a part of it. So right off the bat, I don't care about society. I'm an effing artist. That's how he positions himself. The debate around engaged artists goes back to France and the beginning of the 20th century with the, with the Dreyfus Affair and Emile Zola becoming the first truly engaged artist, making a stand for social justice. And here we have being cle clearly stated, I am not here, I'm just an artist, I don't care about society. Of course, this song is going to undercut that. The song is going to be a protest song while also being an anti-protest song. In that way, he definitely belongs in the chanson tradition of French artists who are so high above everybody else and are able to comment on everything and see everything that they never actually have to be on one side or the other. So the first verse, he talks about how he doesn't care about protesting, how he used to only protest in order to skip school. And when you go to a protest, you're surrounded by these meatheads who are a little bit political with bullhorns. He ends up meeting somebody whose name is France. A little on the nose, a little on the button, but it's okay. He go shows up and meets Mickey, who's wearing a Spider-Man costume. Do you remember how you say Spider-Man in French? Spider-Man. Spider now it used to be l'homme araigné. It used to be in the 70s and 80s. At some point they changed the translation to Spider-Man. So this guy is protesting, he's wearing a Spider-Man costume and the costume is filled with beers. So sort of showing that a lot of people who protest are doing it to party or to have something to do. We have a sort of uh, image of, uh, of Mickey here. They're in the great, 
the Grand Rue, the big boulevards in France, which were paradoxically created to avoid protests. And we learn about Mickey, that he's a conspiracy theorist, that, that the narrator of the song doesn't even think that he's right about anything, he just kind of ignores him. And most importantly, Mickey doesn't believe in any of this stuff either. He's just saying it to make his life less boring. Then someone named Mathilde is also part of this, and she's added here as being quite an interesting person. We have a beautiful little section where Mickey doesn't believe in COVID, so he tries to do the bees. Yeah, that's where he kissed people like that. And then we're introduced to Mathilde, another interesting archetype. Seriously, each one of these characters is, is a character, you know. She is a, a blogger and a journalist, and uh, Hasson describes her as the kind of girl that annoys me and attracts me. And he says very deliberately, if he could, he would write 2021 across her shirt because she so clearly embodies so much of what is laughable and perhaps admirable in 2021. Someone who is correct thinking, but fundamentally superficial. They get into an argument going from topic to topic about gender fluidity, the Uyghurs in China and vegans. And he admits to not knowing anything and that she knows everything much better and also that she's smarter than him. Even though it's early in the afternoon, he starts drinking as well. He likes Mickey. And two hours in to this protest, Ohasson turns to everyone and says, hey, uh, what are we protesting? Into this, we are introduced to the character of France. How are you doing, France? She says she's doing well, but it's clear that she's not. You can tell that she's aged. Even though he saw her 10 years ago, she's actually 20 years older. She can't really leave home. She's completely overwhelmed. In her job, she serves as a nurse, a maid, and a psychologist. This whole story about her life, her bad treatment by her workplace, her fear of the mailbox because of the debt, how she's really, really worried. And fundamentally, the things she's most worried about are her retirement benefits. And that's what they're protesting, the threat to retirement protest, to retirement funds. If you don't know anything about France, you don't know, but that's a very common source of protest. That's why we're protesting against the state. Once we've learned what they're protesting against, things take a turn. There's a description of where the protest gets ugly. He describes it as the blue boxes of the Monopoly board. So there is French Monopoly, and the blue boxes are like the Champs-Élysées, you know, like they're the most important streets in Paris, right? Things devolve. Insults replace chance. There's violence. It's no longer about retirement. Mickey in his Spider-Man suit is getting really violent and he starts punching cops and getting into a fight with cops. Mathilde is very excited because she films him, but then later she's sad because she turned that into a tweet and that tweet became co-opted by the far right because Mickey happened to be half black and they said, this is what happens when you let in people from the cité, from the ghetto even though it turns out Mickey is not at all from the ghetto. He's never put his foot there, as Orasson says. Two white girls in the video say, thank you, France, presumably to the friend, but this becomes a hashtag. And now what was supposed to be a sign of resistance against the state is now being used by the far right as evidence of the unruly non-French people who are causing all the trouble in the streets. Beautifully put together, very on the nose. And, and while, while Orasson hears this, he thinks it's funny. He starts saying how it's funny, and then he gets beaten up by the cops. The beat slows down. He loses time. The cops are angry because they're trying to work for the country, not be humiliated by it. And then the whole song ends with it being clear that France will not get her retirement. All of it was for nothing. The media was fed. The people were beaten, some people had fun, but the people who actually needed the help didn't get it. Do you see how there's like some really good things <laughs> happening with this album? Some interesting, as far as I can tell, this is the best song ever written about a protest. I think so, you know, because it, it's able to, to give you that distance while seeing that there is something to fight for, while pointing out the problems of the people that are fighting it, pointing out the problems of the people that are fighting against it, and showing that the victims are the people who actually needed help. Next song is The Smell of Gas, which I already went into. Jour Meilleur. It's got this kind of guitar and auto-tune. It'll all work out, but I know it's not true. And this is more of that variety kind of stuff. You know, he even sings about the variety, Francaise, in this song. But it's really, I don't know. 
When You Must Cross the Desert, All You Can Do Is Move Forward. Not a very good song, certainly compared to the previous three songs. Uh, some nice poetic details. Yeah. No, the problem with life is that you only have one. That's true. He gets very grand again with the next song, Baise le monde, F the world. Very simple beat, a little more auto-tune. This is sort of about the, the pain of YOLO and globalization. Like the reality of globalization and the desire just to buy things and, and to be a part of society is to buy things you don't need and to use them. He uses the term mentalité zéro lendemain, the mentality of no day after tomorrow. So he has all these weird, he makes all these points and then interrupts himself saying like, what am I talking about? You know? So he talks about drinking uh, a, a Jack and Coke, a whiskey and Coke in a plastic cup that's gonna end up in the ocean and the toxic particles. And he goes, no, wait, 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 what am I talking about? And he tries to get back on, on, tra on track again. He's actually talking about a track suit the entire time. He's wearing a, a fresh new track suit. Looks really good. So he's talking about how he's like actually hanging around this place uh, at this soiree, this fancy party where there's all these anorexic models who are influencing little girls to be anorexic. And then how he eats a little bit of shrimp at the open bar, but the shrimp comes from Madagascar. And then the poor fisherman had to break through the coral reef in order to get the shrimp. And if they didn't, then their family would be, start wait, wait, wait why, why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about this? And then he's talking about, he's listening to this music and it's some music that he really likes, but it's actually by a bunch of rappers who are talking about crime and, and make enough money to get us SUV, and when he has the SUV, everybody, uh, and, and then that contributes to pollution, and then everybody dies because of pollution. Basically, every single time he's trying to get something going, his mind goes to the reality of the thing. And when you get to the reality of the thing, it's something sad and something desperate about our miserable global society. It then accumulates with this amazing thing about his new tracksuit, his new beautiful tracksuit and immediately starts talking about how it's made by someone paid two euros a month in India who plants the seed for the cotton in India and that it takes 2,000 liters of water to feed it. And then it's pulled and put together and then sent to basically a slave camp in China where it's further treated and sent on to Romania where it's put together into a fabric where it's then sent somewhere else to have an insignia put of, a, of, a, uh, of the person who made it who's then sent to somebody who graduated from a fancy school, has to figure out how to sell it to children, and that person figured out how to get a celebrity, and that celebrity's paid millions of dollars, and then it's put in the store, and then he goes to buy it, and then it's on sale, and then he's psyched because he gets to look like a baller without having to spend all the money, and so he does all that. So we go from the cotton seed all the way through China and Romania, and all the poverty and sweatshops and slavery and waste of, of materials and carcinogenic uh, pesticide, uh, herbicides that are put in to make the cotton. All of that goes to him buying it and arriving at the party and seeing someone else wearing it. And I said, ah, ça vaut pas la peine. It wasn't worth all that trouble. All that trouble from the seed to wearing the shirt, it wasn't worth it. Because he, as the consumer, someone else had the same shirt as him. It's pretty good stuff. <laughs> Casseur, uh, Fauteur, Infinity uh, is the only song, I think, that has a guest appearance, a uh, gringe. Kind of a boring song, but I like it. It's just kind of a old school hip hop song about being awesome. Next song, Dernier Ver. Oh, now that's also with a guest appearance, sorry. And that's with the Neptunes. I I'm gonna tell you this. The there's a thing with French rap where if there's ever any American rapper on it, you immediately click to it and you want to hear that because you assume that's got to be the best. This is the worst song on the album. It's not even close. It's not a good song. It's a boring beat and Pharrell's on autopilot. I don't really care about it at all. It sucks. I hate this song. I love the Neptunes. I love Orelson, but this song is no good. Ensemble, kind of a cool funk guitar and sounds. Uh, all this idea of the impossibility of perfection, the impossibility uh, of a perfect love and the world is not perfect if it is real. The next song is like a love song, as far as I can tell, Athena, Athena, um, pour de vrai, pour de vrai, repeated over and over again, like for real, for real. Some quiet moments in the verses. Again, to me, this fits much more in the Varieté Francaise, the kind of hip hop you can listen to if you don't like hip hop. 
There's an epic conclusion to the entire album with the title track, Civilization. Epic, swirling beat with this bass. It reminds me a lot of Who Will Survive in America off of My Dark Twisted Fantasy. Doom, 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 doom. Has that kind of beat. Voices all often doubled strings and strings, and it's so epic. I can't save the world, and I'm not sure I would if I could. The whole song is about the wisdom of ignorance. Very, very frankly, Socrates here, ending his whole thing, talking about how little he knows. And that's the whole point. And if we can kind of put him into this, this, whole, this whole tradition, it makes sense that that's how he ends it. I ran after happiness without taking the time to learn what it is. Very Ahoshuko. I thought science would save us, but I have less and less confidence in progress. Why do I say that? I thought of it, but I know nothing about it. What do I know? Perhaps the father of all, uh, of all moralistes would be Montaigne, who was a little bit earlier than those other people, whose famous slogan was, what do I know? Some people consider that to be the real beginning of modern philosophy and modern thought, even before Descartes, because that's the main thing that he wanted to contribute to the world. This super smart guy who wrote his essays, and he just said, what do I know? It, it's not quite the same thing as all that I know is that I know nothing. What do I know? That's the question. That's the question we have to answer. What do I know? He talks a lot about the vicious circle um, of, of life. One of my favorite lines is, I was afraid that I understood nothing, but now I fear there's nothing to understand. This is sort of a, a, a midlife crisis kind of song too. And that is the feeling that you get as you get older. There's nothing to get. Like, like you thought there was a secret to life and then the secret to life is that it's all pointless. That's not true, because you can have like nice meals with your family. That's the point of life. Not even the nice part. You can have bad, we've been redoing our kitchen and we've been eating like, like, like microwave noodles for like the last three weeks and it's been wonderful. It's actually the human connections. What's that? Two months. It's been two months? Almost, yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is our first meal with our new kitchen, so. But that's not what makes you happy. It's not the new kitchen. It's the connection between the people that are in the kitchen. The second verse is a whole cry for humanity. He wants to be treated as the way, uh, as, you know, treat me the way you would treat other people. I used to dream of leaving France, but now I want to change it. And then everything ends, everything changes. He even gets even more philosophical, a little more of the, the parable of Heraclitus, who can never step into the same river twice. All is changing, everything changes. All is changing, everything changes. If we could, if we could uh, accuse Orelson of something throughout the entire album, it's this kind of centrism, <laughs> this kind of chanson-esque third-person view on life, which potentially comes from privilege, in which you can just sort of say, all, all is changing, everything changes, nothing is lost, you know? Like this kind of perspective definitely applies to philosophers, and philosophers can philosophize best when they actually have some food to eat, you know? Metaphorically speaking and literally speaking, you know? It's easy for me to say it doesn't matter that I'm gonna be eating good food when I'm gonna be eating good food, metaphorically and literally. But still, the end of the album ends with this very poetic tone. All this changes, everything changes, nothing is lost, shadow and light. Civilization. So there you go, that's 44 minutes, god damn. Dinner's almost ready. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you check out Orelson. He's really quite an interesting rapper, quite an interesting chanson singer, quite an interesting member of the Varieté Française, and quite an interesting moraliste. Tell me in the, uh, like the, like the like button and subscribe that I don't care. There's the camera.